It's a completely different process to, to what's traditionally done and as a result quite often takes a little bit of getting, getting your head around because it's a process that, uh, firstly I'll start with what it doesn't do. You know, it doesn't require any drilling, it doesn't require any plating, it doesn't require any pressing, it doesn't require any cutting. So all of those subtractive things that, that we all know and, and, and love um, you know, uh, are not part of the process. So you're really making the entire board from two materials. One conductive, it's printing metal, and one uh, photopolymer, so it's a solidified polymer material which replicates the, the properties of, of FR4 in, in a regular board. And if you kind of imagine you're starting from nothing because it's an additive process and your, your printer, your, you know, your inks are basically placed in you know, a conductor where you want conductive and, and uh, you know, the, the substrate material, the dielectric material where you want that. And it just repeats. So you imagine you're starting at the bottom, you're going to put some ink where you want the pads, you're going to put some ink where you want the substrate to be, and it'll keep building up from the bottom, layer by layer. And these are print layers. These are not PCB layers. So print layers are incredibly thin. We're talking, you know, three microns per pass of the printhead. So it's very, very um, high resolution in that Z axis. And when you've completed your build and you're printing all of the vias, all of the interconnects uh, of any kind, if you need a through hole, you're not drilling, you're just leaving a space where you're not printing. So the process is uh, purely additive. At the end, you've got you know, a, a board made out of these two materials. And unlike most of the 3D printers out there, there's actually genuinely no post-process. So you take that board out of the printer and you're good to go you know, off, to, off to assemble the components. 3D printing is, is, a, is a new technology and 3D printing of electronics is an even newer technology. So you know, it's fair to say that there is a little bit of catch up when it comes to you know, attaining the kind of trace and space features that are possible with uh, you know, cutting edge PCB production lines today. The Dragonfly system uh, is able to print uh, traces and spaces of circa 100 uh, micron. So you know, it's not, uh, not what you'll find perhaps in the, in the latest uh, you know, iPhone, uh, although I didn't get to see the, the review today. But essentially, you know, it's, it's, it's industry standard um, you know, boards. And when it comes to the, the, the thickness of layers, if you're thinking in that, and we speak in, in, in sort of in Z, um, you know, the Z thicknesses are, are actually really, really thin. You know, if you want to print a you know, five, six micron uh, layer between, you know, between your signal layers, the printer is very happy to do that. You know, inkjet is printing with, with very, very, um, very low viscosity inks, almost water-like. And so when those drops land in, in, in their uh, assigned location, you know, they pretty much you know, sp spread out and leave a very, very thin uh, imprint behind. So trace and space about 100. And when you're talking in Z, you know, ridiculously thin. Uh, not a scientific answer, but it's pretty close to the truth. So the dielectric inks that, that are currently available with the Dragonfly system are engineered to be electrically as similar as possible to, uh, to more sort of traditional FR4 or, or phenolic type, uh, type dielectrics, meaning that they're not optimized for you know, the crazy high frequencies that you might otherwise uh, turn to your sort of PTFE type, uh, type materials for. That being said, um, you know, the real focus of the system is, is for, for rapid prototyping, rapidly cycling through, through ideas and we, we do test our materials up to sort of 20, 30 uh, gigahertz and you know, they, they maintain a very, uh, uh, very stable uh, dielectric performance all the way through to those very, very high uh, bounds. So they might not be the ideal uh, production material, but from a, an R&D perspective, they give you, they give you, uh, you know, uh, milestones that you can work for. So when, when you're designing for printing on the Dragonfly, Really, our, our goal was to put none of the effort on, on the designer uh, whatsoever. You know, that if we do anything that, that is a, an interruption of their normal workflow, then you know, nobody's going to want to use the system. So the printer and the software that we use is designed to be completely um, sort of backwards compatible with traditional Gerber and, and Exelon files. So if you can export in, in, in Gerber format and you can export your, your Exelon, our software will essentially uh, port that over. You check the stack up 
there's one piece of information that's missing in those, uh, in those Gerber files, which is you know, the Z height, essentially, of any given layer, and the printer will uh, very much want to know what those are. But once you've input that information, you, know, you, hit, uh, you hit print and, and go and have a coffee. Or, if it's a big board, maybe a couple. When it comes to using the system, it's, it's, it's essentially a standalone uh, entity. So the materials are uh, you know, carefully engineered for this particular deposition technology, for this sort of inkjet printing. Um, they're also very carefully engineered for one another because you're doing multi-material printing, which even in traditional 3D printing with non-electrically functional inks is pretty tough. You know, printing metal and polymer together, these are all very carefully engineered uh, to work hand in hand. There's no need for additional tools to get this system to work. So if you've, you know, if you've got electricity uh, and you've got EDA software um, and you've got your Gerbers and your drills, you know, you're going to be good to go. And the Dragonfly platform has been in beta over the last year. We actually wrapped that, um, that beta program up in July and we had systems you know, all over the States, in Europe uh, and, and back at home in Israel as well. And the learnings from that uh, very collaborative work with, uh, with that cohort of users we had uh, has really led us to the point where we're launching the system commercially uh, now. So it's currently commercially available. Certainly from what we've seen is you know, places that have uh, a real need to save time. You know, printing in-house is a great tool for time compression. It's not just because you can print your final uh, you know, sort of prototype, uh, but it's all the little things you do on the way. You may have a couple of you know, forks in the road. Do I, you know, do I solve, uh, solve this issue with, uh, with design A or design B? Maybe even quite early on in the, in the, in the ideation stage. So if you're, if you're under time pressure or you have a need to perhaps try a range of different, uh, different ideas out, this is going to be very, very quick. So you know, if you're looking at traditional PCB, you might have the whole cycle being quite long. If you're looking at things like antennas, you, know, you can print those as well. And quite often, you know, having a, a real uh, physical evaluation is going to be uh, very informative. There are other places, such as the, in the defense community or even in some consumer electronics spaces, where security is really of the essence. And so if you're looking to keep your, your projects as safe as, as possible and keep what you're working on in-house for as long as possible, Again, having that capability in-house to, to cycle through, to test, uh, and keep your, your, you know, your secure IP in-house for that little bit longer. So we found it's really, you know, it's, it's quite similar to the origins of traditional 3D. If you go back 10 years and you look at who was using 3D printing, you know, it was aerospace, it's space, it's defense companies, um, and places that have a you know, need for rapid product development that you know, are willing to uh, you know, spend, spend a bit of money to buy a piece of equipment that will get them to market that little bit faster. Electronics will be the same.